Number five, St. Clair's fingernails and her hair. Now some people say that fingernails and hair continue to grow after the body passes away. This is commonly repeated but actually not true because rather it's the skin around the fingernails retracting that gives the illusion that the fingernails are still growing. I thought I would just toss in a totally unrelated fun fact you can use at a party. These fingernails aren't growing at all because they're not attached to anybody and they're kept in a glass box alongside some of St. Clair's wonderful curls like the world's worst and possibly stinkiest time capsule. Now St. Clair was often overshadowed by her more famous mentor, Francis of Assisi, but St. Clair was her own woman, accomplished in her own right. She founded her own order of nuns, the Poor Clares. Inspired by Francis's teachings when she was a teenager, she renounced the world and founded an order based on the ideals of extreme poverty and contemplation. I should probably look into this order because being extremely broke and contemplating being extremely broke is about 99% of what I do. The order spread popularity and houses of Poor Clares were established far away from her home convent in Assisi. Now it's said that part of what made St. Clair's decision to give up the worldly life so inspiring was that not only was she blessed to be born into a family of great wealth, but oh, va va voom, St. Clair was a real stunner. Now, you know, the depictions we have to work with may not look like much, but they called her the first Jenner for her luscious lips and flowing locks. As proof of her devotion, Frances trimmed her beautiful extravagant hair as a physical manifestation of rejecting her former vain existence. As you can see, I'm not quite there yet. I'm still quite happy with my vain, disgusting hair. Now someone down the line managed to get a hold of St. Clair's hair and fingernails. Maybe they were just sweeping the barber room floor. These uh, treasures, for lack of a better word, were kept and encased in a reliquary at the basilica named in her honor. This also contains a rock crystal flask with her fingernails. Really not sure why anyone felt they needed to keep that. Uh, I'm not sure how holy these are, but hey, I'm not a saint or a bishop or a pope or any of that stuff. I'm just a YouTuber and I'm barely that even. But if you want to hear more of me narrating some of these strange and peculiar parts of the big globe we share, Top 5 Scary is the place to be. We got a little something for everyone. So make sure you click on through, like this video, subscribe and hit that little bell and we can keep on bringing you screams every single day, twice a day and then some. But do that at the end of this video, okay? We got way more weird Catholic relics coming up for you. Number four, papal hearts. You know, they say some people wear their hearts on their sleeves, and some people collect 22 hearts in marble urns inside a beautiful reliquary. We all have our hobbies, we all collect things. Just make sure those hearts are still in their original packaging, otherwise, you know, they're totally worthless. Well, these aren't just regular old hearts, these are the hearts of 22 former popes. Obviously, obviously, they're former popes if their hearts are, obviously. <laughs> at the Church of Santi Vincenzo e Anastasio at Trivia. Oof, that's a mouthful, we're not saying that again. You can find the sealed hearts of 22 popes in marble urns for all to appreciate. The popes are listed to the left of the altar, with the oldest coming in all the way from the 15th century with Sixtus V to the fresh and still beating heart of Leo XIII in 1903. Now this custom of separating a pope's organs from the corpse sounds a bit Strange, or a bit Egyptian, like they might mummify them. And then this process was called precordia, and was done to prevent decay while funeral arrangements were made, and just to test a little bit if they were worried the Pope was going to reanimate. The tradition started up in the 14th century when it was established that when a Pope passed away, they would be mourned for nine days. Nine days, with suffrage messages being said each day. They borrowed this little schedule from the Byzantines, who observed deaths of their emperors in a very similar manner. Really taken a while off, they took a whole pay period to mourn the loss, and then you dry those tears right up, get back to work. Now, this was all the rage for popes of yesteryear, very trendy, very in fashion. But Pope Pius X in 1914 had a change of heart when he expressly forbade it in his burial and will. He said, don't do any of that weird stuff to me. Those were his exact words, if you can believe it. Now since then, his successors have all agreed and have all done the same. But who's to say? I feel this could be coming back in fashion. Pope Francis, how you feeling? You gotta listen to your heart on this one. Number three, the holy souls of purgatory. Purgatory, in Catholic belief, is kind of like a giant waiting room while the upper management figures out just where exactly they're going to find a good spot that's best for you. Well, that's simplifying it a bit, obviously. The soul is thought to be stranded in purgatory until it atones for its earthly sins, but 
You can hurry the process up just a little bit if your loved ones back on earth are praying for you. In the back of the Chiesa del Sacro Cure del Suffragio del Piccolo Museo del Purgatorio or Museum of the Holy Souls in Purgatory holds a collection of relics that have been singed by the hands of the souls of those trapped in purgatory. These burned handprints are believed to be the souls trying to communicate that their loved ones need to pray harder. I don't know about you, but I would definitely start praying real hard if burned handprints started showing up in my books, but I would be praying for an exorcist, more likely. Now, this is kind of interesting, and I didn't even know this. Purgatory isn't even mentioned directly in the Bible, but the concept of purgatory dates back to the 11th century. This notion that trapped souls needed to be freed came from a story told to the abbot Odillo of Cluny by a monk returning from the Holy Land. He told this story about how this ship had been wrecked, that he'd been cast ashore on a mysterious island, and a hermit who lived on the island related his own story of a chasm from which screams of trapped souls and demonic flames rose and ravaged. He told of how the demons would complain about losing souls when your loved ones would pray for their behalf. So November 2nd was established as All Souls Day. Everybody, all the souls. Where it was believed that prayers by the living could help get all of those trapped dead in purgatory loose. You know, it's kind of like that one episode of The Simpsons where the town comes together to get Bart out of the well. It's a, it's a similar enough concept, you know? They sang a song, you pray, souls get out, Bart gets out, pretty much one and the same. This particular collection of burned relics in particular though, was collected when Victor Jouet, the missionary behind the collection, experienced a fire that burned part of the original suffragio, leaving behind a scorched image of a face that he believed was a trapped soul. Now again, just me personally, but if I saw a face burned into one of my possessions, I would move entirely, call an exorcist, be putting salt circles around my feet for the rest of my life, but I appreciate what he did too. Number two, the Santa Maria della Concezione Crypts. Whew, my Italian is not as good as it should be. <laughs> Inside the Santa Maria della Concezione crypts, as many as 4,000 friars lie here. Well, lie is probably the wrong word, as they hang here is probably a more accurate description. As these 4,000 bodies are hanging from the rafters, decorating the space of every inch of the church. Now, it might seem a bit grim, or beautiful, depending on your twisted point of view. We're a scary channel, I ain't gonna judge you. There's a certain chic to it. But I wouldn't be surprised if they have to spend a few hundred a month on keeping air fresheners and incense just running all the time there. Now, you might reasonably be wondering, hey, why do they hang bones from the wall like they're throwing a Halloween party and no one went to the store to get actual decorations and they had to make do with what they had? Well, they're not just festive. The practice dates back from the 16th century when the Capuchin friars, not named after the monkey, but because of the hoods they wore, left the friary of St. Bonaventure to come live at Santa Maria della Concezione. They were ordered by the Pope's brother at the time to bring the remains of deceased friars with them to their new home so that all the Capuchins could lie together. With a huge amount amount of bodies on their hands, the brothers decided to get a little fun with it and decorate the walls of the crypts with their bones as a way of reminding them that death comes for all of them. Surely there's a slightly easier way to remind you of the ever-present mortality that hangs over us than literally hanging a bunch of pelvises to the buttresses, but what do I know? A plaque in the crypt reads, what you are now, we once were. What we are now, you shall be. Which is, is grim. <laughs> No way around it. The crypt contains a little bit of everything inside you. Crypt of skulls, lovely load of leg bones, and the star of the show is definitely the crypt of pelvises. Oh, make sure you get a photo in there. Make sure you grab a fridge magnet from the pelvis room gift shop. And number one, St. John the Baptist's many heads. They say two heads are better than one, which might be proof of what a great man St. John the Baptist is, because no one can seem to agree how many heads the guy actually had. The saint's head was supposedly brought back from Constantinople in 1206 by the crusader Wallen de Satan, but it seems this happened more than a few times, since three different shrines across the globe all claim to have the original head of St. John the Baptist, and no one's able to clear this up anytime soon. St. John was a forerunner of Jesus Christ, and the New Testament says that John was beheaded by Herod around 28 CE as a punishment for criticizing his recent divorce. Yeesh. Paintings of the beheading depicted on a silver platter, which is a, a nice, 
Nice way to get a severed head, I think. That's, I, I don't know if I ever want a head delivered to me, but if I had to, I would want it on a silver platter. According to the legend, there really was a silver platter his head was delivered on that made its way to Constantinople or Istanbul, but was sold by the Crusaders in order to pay for his travels back. John's head was on display in the Amiens Cathedral up until the French Revolution, where they confiscated all church treasures, and it would eventually return home in 1816, then going all the way back to Rome from Greek monks who brought it to a shrine decorated with beautiful stained glass, one panel depicting the head on a silver platter. You think you wouldn't want to remember that. Well, here's where the trouble comes in. A German museum in Munich also takes great pride in having St. John's head. The Munich Residence Museum contains a bunch of other holy relics, but their most prized is the alleged St. John's head, although no one really knows how it got there. This skull is wrapped in cloth and heavily interred with gems. Now two would be impressive, but St. John's got a crowd worth of heads because he's got three. His last head can be found in Damascus, Syria in the Umad Mosque, one of the oldest and largest mosques in the world. This relic, also not exposed, wrapped in a cloth, and is currently located in a shrine dedicated to the saint. So will the real John the Baptist please stand up? Or do all three of these heads actually really belong to him and he had to be beheaded three times for it to take? You know what, don't answer that. I'm not sure if that's something I really want to know. Number five, Oliver Plunkett's head. Now in the other two videos, we talked about the head of St. Catherine of Siena and we also talked about St. John the Baptist and how many heads he may or may not have had scattered across the world. And I'm not one to break tradition, so I thought for part three, I would include a third holy saintly severed head, this time belonging to Oliver Plunkett. Plunkett. A notable difference between the two other severed heads is that this one is probably the most disgusting one we've included on these lists. I know these are all holy relics, but let me just say, out of context, this is absolutely horrifying and looks like it's straight out of a grind host horror movie that you'd find in a, a dirty basket somewhere. <laughs> Oliver Plunkett, before becoming a head, was an Irish Catholic Archbishop who was a victim of the Popish plot. Now if you're not up to date on your Catholicism, that's a whole other video worth of explaining. I don't know much about the Popish plot, I'm not the guy to do that for you. But the short version is that it was a conspiracy falsely alleging that there was a plot against the Protestant King Charles II. Oliver Plunkett happened to end up on the receiving end of something really bad. Uh, namely, he was executed, which is pretty bad. But they really went out of their way to destroy Oliver Plunkett, his public image, his body. They called his praising of the Roman Catholic Church high treason. And his punishment was a slow and arduous death. He was hung, drawn, and finally quartered. Uh, and just in case there were any odds of him pulling through on a miraculous recovery, as a final effort, they yeeted his head into a fire where it was rescued by a friend of Plunkett. I'd like to think I would do that for my friends. Well, after being recovered, the head was rescued and stored hidden away in a nunnery, eventually brought to Ireland in 1995, where he's now kept on display in the National Shrine to the Saint. He was canonized for his troubles, and he is the first new Irish saint in about 700 years. It's high time for some new blood, I think. So. You can go, you can pay your respects to him, and maybe offer him some skin cream, because uh, that skin's looking a little dry. And if you're looking for more creepy videos on weird relics or all sorts of strange things, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. If there's something scary, the odds are pretty good we've got a video or two on it. And if you haven't already, subscribe, hit that bell for more videos every single day, but do that at the end of this video, okay? We got way more weird Catholic relics coming up for you. Number four, St. Teresa's hand. Now, if you've watched our other videos on this subject, then no doubt you're already very familiar with the practice of making remnants of saints into relics. Now, something that's directly from a saint is called a first class relic. That means it's something that came off of their body, you know? Uh, their hair, their fingernails, a vial of their fluids, or in the case of the lovely Saint Teresa, her whole hand. Encased in a beautiful ornate golden reliquary with gems all over the knuckles and the editors are goofing off because that's just a picture of the Infinity Gauntlet from Avengers Endgame. Wait, that, that's the real, that's what it really looks like. Yeah, it seems that Marvel Studios was more than inspired by the incorruptible Saint Teresa's hand when designing the weapon that would give Thanos the power to wipe out half the universe. Throw a comparison pic of them side by side, they're almost indistinguishable. I'm not 
100% certain if there's any symbolism or connection there, but I'm sure St. Teresa would love to know she was involved. She was a huge fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and all the things they do. When St. Teresa of Avila passed away, the sisters of her convent buried her with the hopes of keeping her holy body with them. Nine months later, she was exhumed, only to discover that her body was intact. She hadn't decayed at all. That's why they thought she was incorruptible. Now, I'm not sure I totally follow the logic here, but after they discovered her body was incorruptible, they uh, took her hand off and put it into this golden infinity gauntlet thing as a way of inviting people to get closer to God through the saint's body. Now, this might not seem appealing to you, but there's a surprising demand for this relic. Near the end of the Spanish Civil War, General Francisco Franco had the hand removed from the convent and allegedly kept it close by, and if some of the wilder rumors are true, he would keep it by his pillow for good luck. You really gotta hand it to him. He was a devout follower of the faith. Today, you can find the hand in Iglesia de Nuestra Señora de la Merced in Ronda, Andalusia, and you don't even have to rip a stone out of the vision's forehead to get a good look at this gauntlet. Number three, the Veil of Veronica. Now on these lists of holy relics, we've had all sorts of strange things. We've had fingernails, teeth, dried up hands. We got milk coming up later. All things that have come from the body. Well, this next one is no different. It's the Veil of Veronica. And to put it gently, it's a sweat rag that's a few thousand years old. Probably one of the most pungent odors on the planet. Imagine every gym locker room you've ever been in times a thousand. When Jesus carried the cross, bruised and beaten, there was one person among the crowds who saw fit to help him out a little. Veronica wiped Jesus' face with this rag, and miraculously his face transferred onto the rag like it was silly putty on the funny papers. Now as an outsider, I thought this is what the Shroud of Turin was. That was the wrapping used to wrap Jesus after his death, so the thing I'm learning is that Jesus left an imprint of his face on just about any surface he touched. You give him a hug, have his face on the shoulder of your shirt for the rest of your life as a sacred artifact. Now, the Veil of Veronica is hard to nail down hard, concrete facts on. It's never been officially canonized as a relic of the church, and is only alleged to exist. It's claimed to be owned at St. Peter's in Rome, although this particular relic is not on public display anywhere. Probably for the best. Honestly, don't know if I want to see a 2,000 year old sweat stain. The ones underneath my shirts are bad enough. Now, it might sound like I'm being disparaging, referring to this relic multiple times as a sweat rag or a sweat stain, but I would like to offer this. The Latin name for the veil is Sudarium. Sudarium literally translates to sweat cloth, so even the official churchly terminology for this relic acknowledges that it's just a stinky rag that has some sweat on it, but a holy stinky rag that has some sweat on it. Number two, Mother Mary's Milk. We're gonna do our best to get through this, I promise. Mother's Milk might be my favorite Red Hot Chili Peppers album. It's my favorite character on The Boys, and it might just be one of the oddest relics on a series of odd relics that's all the way to part three. Took a lot of restraint to not put this in the first two, but we're on part three, so here it is now. As incredibly odd as it may sound, the Virgin Mary's Milk is considered a relic of the Catholic Church. I, I, I hope They've been keeping that in the fridge, lest it spoils. Does, does holy milk spoil? Is everything I've said in this video profoundly heretical? There is a church called the Church of Milk Grotto, built outside Bethlehem. The history goes that the Madonna and child had taken refuge in this cave, and while she was feeding, milk spilled outwards and blessed the stone of the cave, turning it completely white. Now, the church serves as a popular shrine for women who are struggling with fertility, who hope that the lasting aura and presence of the Virgin Mary will bless them. There is a legend that goes with it. Saint Bernard, the saint, not the big dog that has his tongue hanging out, was devoted to the Mother Mary. And one day, he was praying at a statue of the Madonna, and he asked it to give him some sign, some proof that she was a mother. I guess the statue has like an odd sense of humor, because it sprayed milk onto Saint Bernard, uh, depending on the variation of the story, either his eye or in his mouth, I saw a lot of, of really interesting paintings depicting this scene. And editors, I hope you're having so much fun trying to find photos for this one. I am so sorry. Truly, rest in peace your search history. In the Middle Ages, vials of the milk were sold and transported all over Europe. For what purpose, I could not tell you. These days, the Church of Milk Grotto sells a limestone powder made from the stone walls of the grotto, meant to be dissolved in a drink and consumed. Uh, kind of like crystal light, but it's holy milk. Probably heals all that ails, and it's a good source of calcium, perhaps. And number one, the holy prep use. This is gonna be the one that takes the channel down. You have no idea the restraint it's taken me to, to only be bringing this up now in part three of, of Strange Relics. 
This is probably the strangest relic of them all. We'll do our best to discuss this with reverence and also somehow figure out how to stay within content guidelines. Editors, best of luck. When Jesus was born, on his eighth day, uh, a small piece of his skin was removed in a traditional ritual performed on Jewish men when they're born. Okay, are you, are you sort of following along with what I'm saying here? This particular part of the body that I can't quite mention that was removed at birth was an immensely holy relic to the Catholic Church called the Holy Prepuce. Now the very bizarre part regarding the history of the Holy Prepuce isn't just that it exists at all, it's how much trouble one bit of skin would cause. You see, the prepuce first pops up in the year 800, when Charlemagne gave it to Pope Leo III on December 25th, making it one of the oddest Christmas gifts ever given in human history. From here, it stayed until 1527. Now, when Rome was sacked, a German soldier stole the prepuce and tried to keep it for himself until it was eventually recovered again and became the centerpiece of the village of Calcutta, where it was seen as the most exciting thing to happen in a while. It was like a celebrity showed up to the village. It was this great, big, important deal. They had a part of the body of the Savior. All manner of miracles are reported to have been the result of the Holy Prepuce. However, several other churches, villages, priests, all claimed that they had the true Holy Prepuce, and any other ones you might have heard of out there were false. This problem became rampant, and in the early 1900s, the church wanted to wash their hands of the Holy Prepuce entirely and outright forbade any discussion of it in church matters. It was actually an excommunicable offense to so much as bring up the Prepuce, meaning this video is pure heresy. In 1983, the prepuce was stolen from the church in Calcutta. Where is it now? Where did it go? Absolutely no one knows. No one's fessed up. You know, if you took it, I think now's a good time to just admit you did it. But if they're ever looking for a plot line for a third National Treasure movie, I have an absolutely amazing idea for something Nicolas Cage could steal. Number five, St. Catherine's Head. Coming up first on our list of strange artifacts that the Catholic Church has hidden away is the severed, mummified head of the revered St. Catherine of Siena. And you wouldn't really expect there to be a severed head kept out on display, but it is an important head, I've come to understand. When she was young, St. Catherine had a vision of Jesus on a throne surrounded by saints. Afterwards, she devoted her life to Catholicism and she gave herself to the nunnery. Cut her hair, scalded herself, and took a vow of celibacy. At 28, Catherine was said to have received the stigmata when five red rays shot out of the crucifix she was praying to and pierced her hands, her feet, and her heart. But these were far from the only miracles attributed to the lovely Saint Catherine, however. She was said to be seen levitating once during prayer, and even once a priest said he saw a holy communion fly from his hand directly directly into her mouth. Now, I will be honest, that does make her sound a bit like a saintly golden retriever, but okay. Catherine would pass at the young age of 33 and would be canonized a century later. If you don't know, that's a fancy word for being made into a saint post-mortem. While she passed in Rome, there was some disagreement as to where the young saint should be laid to rest eternally. Her hometown of Siena quite wanted her body back. Her spiritual leader, Raymond of Capua, knew he wouldn't really be able to smuggle her entire body past guards in Rome, so he elected to just uh, take her head in a bag. Which normally would be terrifying behavior, but it's good here. The story goes that when the guards intercepted Raymond, he prayed to Catherine, and when they looked inside his sack, they found naught but a collection of rose petals and not a severed head. Her final miracle. Now the head was placed in a relic, a reliquary, that's a difficult word to say, especially on a teleprompter. The head was placed in a reliquary, where it still remains today, and you can go and pray to it, and I pray promise it's not gonna blink or anything at you even though it looks like it just might. And if you're looking for way more stories of creepy relics locked away, haunted object, cursed things, cryptids, conspiracies, aliens, the whole scary nine yards, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. So hit that little bell, hit
hit subscribe and make sure you do not miss a single thing. Do it after this video, okay? We got way more creepy things locked away coming up for you right now. Number four, the Grand Grimoire. Our next entry has been formally referred to as the Gospel of Satan and is said to be a cursed book whose knowledge had to be sealed away to protect humanity. So this might be the most deadly book ever published after Hop on Pop. The Grand Grimoire, who is said to have been penned by a priest in the 16th century who was possessed by a litany of demons who compelled the man to put their knowledge to paper. Acting as a scribe for these demons, the man wrote everything they knew about dark incantations, spells, instructions on how to cast rituals, ways to bind a demon to you, to make it your little minion and do your bidding. Wait, a demon gave instructions on how it wants to be bound to a human? To serve humans? Freaky little demon. That's not all too. There is a step-by-step -step recipe for a little necromancy if you're down to dabble in some dark arts and make some bones dance to your rhythm. The book really covers all the fun stuff you have been told not to do. It's not just brimstone and hellfire neither. There's rituals to help manipulate luck, how to conduct a seance, and I actually think this is adorable. There's even ways to make people love you in there. But dating tip from old Tay, uh, if you need a demon's help to make them like you, it might not be the strongest relationship. So just a heads up. Now if all of this is sounding super appealing and I don't blame you, I played a necromancer in Skyrim, I want to make the bones raise, just know that this book is considered high treason. Even so much as cracking the spine is considered is considered equivalent to selling your soul. So, you know, maybe hold off on that Amazon order for a bit. Also, I'm pretty sure the copy they're selling on Amazon is not the original because due to the book's cursed reputation, the original copy is said to be locked away in the Vatican secret archives and I'm sorry, but no matter how many times you ask, they're not gonna let you look at it even if you swear you're just taking a little peek just to look at the illustrations and maybe the dedications. They're gonna keep it locked up. I know. Number three, Hyacinth of Caesarea. Our next entry is the bones of Hyacinth of Caesarea, another Catholic mummy. I'm starting to think there's more Catholic mummies than there were Egyptian ones. Incredibly ornate and gorgeous, the bones of Hyacinth look like something out of one of the Indiana Jones sequels rather than like a real thing you can go and see, but I promise you they are totally extant. On the grounds of the Furstenfeld Abbey reside the relics of two saints. Now these aren't just like a toenail or a tongue and more on that later, but these are full on science class skeletons dressed to the nine in gold and jewels, encrusted in more diamonds and rubies than you could imagine. They are probably worth more than your and my apartments combined. Old Hyacinth, Pisces, as he liked to be called by his friends, was an obscure martyr from the early days of Christianity, slain by the Romans for his faith. We know precious little about him today, but we know that his name appears in a list of martyrs from the 4th century, which suggests that he used to be pretty important, and he was popular enough to write his name down on a list, much like what I'm doing right now. Look at how history repeats itself like that. Isn't that fascinating? Now, Hyacinth's skeleton showed up at the Church of the Assumption in, uh, I'm gonna excuse the pronunciation here, Furstenfeldbruck near Munich at an unknown date. Did somebody just dropped him off? Somebody just dumped a bag of bones on the front step like he's a baby you're giving up for adoption at the fire station? No more questions. The church was sacked by the Swedish army in the 17th century, and when it was rebuilt, they really went all out with the decor. Going over the top, a little baroque, including a skeleton decked out in bling, looking like he is about to take over the skeleton rap scene. So that's Hyacinth. Largely not remembered in life for any particular reason beyond being slain for his religion and remembered forever as a ludicrously swagged out skeleton. We can all only hope for similar legacies as dear sweet Hyacinth. Number two, the tongue of Saint Padilla. Did you know your tongue is made up of eight muscles? Maybe you didn't. Did you know that one of the most important relics to the Catholic Church is a dried up 8,000 year old tongue that looks like beef jerky kept inside a golden helmet that looks like something out of a dark fantasy 80s movie? Well now you do. And have you enjoyed how much of this list is mummified bodies in gold? Because I have. Saint Anthony was said to be a jewel case of the Bible, making a name for himself with his apparently extremely inspirational sermons that won the Catholic Church many new members. People would flock in just to hear what Saint Anthony was talking about. 
apparently he even got a bunch of ex-Christians to reform and rejoin the faith. He was apparently an incredibly accomplished public speaker and I would say that he had a silver tongue but we actually have proof of what color his tongue was because it's kept in a little glass jar. Saint Anthony would pass away in 1231 from edema, a horrible disease that causes a buildup and blockage of fluid in the body's tissues. Now some 30 years later in 1263 he was exhumed and shocking the grave diggers who were doing it. While his body had rotted and decomposed, his legendary tongue was still intact as incorruptible as it had been in life, allegedly still wet with saliva. I wonder if he could still taste. Seeing it was a miracle, the grave diggers took his tongue alongside the bottom half of his jaw and they are both displayed in the Basilica of St. Anthony of Padua in elaborate gold reliquaries. But honestly it looks like something straight out of Warhammer 40k. Does no one think this is as odd as I do? Maybe I'm an outsider. I didn't grow up terribly Catholic so I don't really know these imagery. I know the story behind it isn't terribly scary but the image of this tongue and jaw inside a little glass helmet wrapped in gold looks like something I would ask an AI to make if I typed in nightmare. A tongue shouldn't look like that. <laughs> and I feel like a jaw shouldn't look like that either. Am I alone in this? Am I weird for thinking this is weird? You let me know down below in the comments if maybe I just lack context on all of this. And number one, Camilus de Lelis' heart. Camilus de Lelis was a man with a big heart, full of love, never ending in generosity. We know just how big his heart is because it is kept in a glass jar and it is salted to preserve its legacy. Ugh. Camilla started out pretty humble, born in 16th century Naples. He would later become a soldier until a brutal gambling problem would end up overtaking his life, leaving him in rags driving a donkey cart, but he knew that a far better life was out there. Eventually, he was urged by a friar to explore the lighter side of his soul, and eventually someone was able to pierce his heart both figuratively and later literally, and persuaded him into seeking divine retribution. Camillus would devote his life to providing for the ailing, but tragically and perhaps unsurprisingly if you spent all your time around sick people before modern medicine, a lifetime of caring for the sick led to him also becoming gravely ill, soaking up a litany of ailments including a sore in his leg for 46 years, a rupture for 38 years, two callous sores in the sole of a foot, violent nephritic colics, intense kidney pain, and for a long time a loss of appetite. Now, all of these things, working in tandem, would eventually claim Camillus, a man who gave his life to healing the sick. So post-mortem he was canonized and thought of as the patron saint of the sick. And what better way, I ask, to venerate a man famous for his ever giving heart than to cut his heart out like he was in the temple of doom and start salting his heart like it was beef jerky. You can go to St. Mary Magdalene's church in Rome to go see if his heart, you know, put a stethoscope up to it, check if it's still beating, but it's pretty dried up and tucked away behind glass where you can go and pay your respects and see if it has any life left to bestow and maybe if it'll help you out with an illness at all.